there's a lot of people that are looking for a sign, right? That sign or that thing in their life that, that where it gets painful just enough to finally turn the corner and go, I'm finally ready to, to take, you know, my life in my own hands. You know, will you talk more about your past and, you know, how, how what, what was the big fulcrum that pushed you over the, over the edge? Grady Paulson here, Family First Life America. Excited to have Drake Germani on with us, joining us from Dublin, California, from his secret lair where he protects uh, families all over the country. Um, and, and what's exciting about Drake is, you know, he'll tell his story here in a second, but he's been with us for 90 days. 90 days. And you know what most people do in 90 days? They don't do much. You know, most people do in 90 days, they think about doing. Uh, think about they think about doing they think about thinking and um what happened with drake is he got involved he's plugged into our training calls uh he plugged into live dials and he sacrificed you know everything in his probably personal life to put forth the direction that he needed to have to build the skills which is a skills a communicative skills to communicate with a client a stranger on the phone who showed interest but we still have to build trust find their pain address it with a product and then pr put the protection in place and in 90 days, Drake has protected over 100 families. And um, he's very humble. He's very kind. But I'm going to do my best to pry out all of his secrets. And if you're on here with us right now, uh, excited for you to be on here. Uh, but you're in for a treat today. So let me I'll, I'll slow down and pass it over to you. How are you doing today, Drake? You know, like I said, Grady, I'm uh, another day in paradise. Any day on the right side of the grass is a good day. And uh, being able to help others makes it that much better. Um, thank you for the warm introduction. Uh, I can't tell you how honored I am to be here to possibly add value to others. Um, you know, I've taken in s thousands of videos that you've hosted with so many people you've interviewed and it's resonated and I've just kind of repeat, 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 make my own repeat and test it. So practice is kind of everything. Um, I was introduced, luckily, to Family First by you. I've been fortunate enough to be in your uh, email drip campaigns for probably the last seven years or longer. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to be unfortunate and get in an accident at uh, the big corporate bank where I worked and put me out of commission for 90 days. And I said, Grady, I got to get licensed. Let's do this now. And you're like, uh, yeah, seven years ago, buddy. So I did it uh, in, you know, three weeks, took my test, passed, um, was getting out of the banking industry and yeah, went live July 1st and kind of fell in love with a better way to service customers with uh, unlimited inventory. I love it. I love it. And so you, I mean, just for clarity, right? Your background is in banking. Will you expand more on that? Because there's a lot of people that watch these that have been with a company for a long period of time, or they've been in a sales gig for a long period of time. And you weren't making bad money, you were making good money. Maybe not like, you know, Northern California, uh, you know, Ferrari money, but you're making good money by society standards. But you came to a turning point in your life where things had changed and changes and I don't let you expand on it. But there's a lot of people that are looking for a sign right? That sign or that thing in their life that, that where it gets painful just enough to finally turn the corner and go, I'm finally ready to, to take, you know, my life in my own hands. You know, will you talk more about your past and, you know, how, how what, what was the big fulcrum that pushed you over the, over the edge? So I have a very colorful past. I grew up in the Bay area, California, and, uh, I literally, you know, was a musician, recorded bands, went to concerts all over the country for free because of me being affiliated with a lot of people in the music industry. Uh, I didn't even drive a car till I got married, Grady. Um, <laughs> I mountain biked all over. Um, I My first job was at McDonald's. You know, the second job was doing frozen yogurt. Uh, you know, the third job was working for my father's corporate travel business in San Francisco. Um, then I got married, 
Um, my wife had a two year old. Uh, we had another one happily on the way. I was working for Clear Channel Entertainment, running concerts with 3,000 staff members uh, at Shoreline Amphitheater and Concord Pavilion. Um, you know, everyone from Kenny Chesney to Metallica to Slayer, uh, you know, to everything you can imagine. I worked with them. Um, and long story short, I got a good friend of mine came in at the time I was running a blockbuster videos and uh, training managers and working at an AT&T, which then was a Pac Bell wireless cell phone store and running concerts at night and on the weekend. And a friend said, hey, I want to introduce you to the market manager of Wells Fargo. He'd love you. And I go, OK. And that's how I got reeled into banking, even though my degrees in engineering and audio um, every time I got offered a job in LA, the wife's like, I'd rather be broke and live by my family with our family. And I'm like, okay. So I kind of got in this recycled, uh, gutless rat race, you would call it where you make a decent living, but you know, we live in the Bay area. And at that point, you know, I had my stepdaughter, I had my wife, we had a house we bought in 2000. Um, we had a baby on the way. And shortly had another one. And then I got drafted by JP Morgan to get rid of the WAMU people in banking. Um, Cause I tend to be a little more aggressive in coaching and sales. And uh, then I said, you know, I'm kind of beat up over this coaching and being responsible for others. So I went to business banking and was a relationship manager uh, of where I spent most of my career until I came here. Um, managing clients is and their books of business and helping them grow. And it was a lot more rewarding. Um, went to U.S. Bank. Uh, turns out the CEO is friends with the in-law. Uh, and one of his VPs was in my father-in-law's driveway one day when I pulled up. And I had a week, you know, a week later, I was working for U.S. Bank. So I no longer commuted two hours each way uh, in a miserable, gutless rat race. Um, and I got to that pushing point where before the pandemic, I was home based because I was a, a VP, whatever that means, consultant in high net worth business clients. But it really means nothing uh, when you live here because it's so expensive. Um, and you'd been in my ear for years. And I just was too afraid to let go of the constant paycheck that was gone the minute I got it, but it was there. Um, and knowing that I could sell when I got hurt, I said, OK, wait a minute. You know, I can't work for 90 days. I'm going to go stir crazy. I have a lot of energy. I'm always busy. What am I going to do in this recliner back here besides get fat and watch Netflix and, uh, you know, drink wine? Well, I quit drinking <laughs> four years ago. So it was just get fat and watch Netflix. And instead, I watched your video and I just fell in love with it. And then it just became more and more addicting as I got more and more deep into years back of folks doing in-home and you doing presentations, you know, with a TV screen behind you that had a flannel, you know, sheet over it. And you were, you know, animated and passionate about helping people. And everybody you interviewed, there was a reason you interviewed them was because they were passionate and had something they could share. So being here with you today uh, really touches my heart. Um, the accident is what forced me to do something better. And I wish I had done it sooner. I'm kicking myself, but in a positive way, it pushes me harder because I, there's no limit and it's so rewarding to assist people, let the client know, oh, I'm so excited. Congratulations. You're approved. Is it okay if I call your daughter, Samantha, I'm going to give her my contact card since you said she's Apple as well. And on her worst day ever, she's going to know how to reach me. And, you know, of course, we won't discuss anything about the policy. I'm just Drake, the broker, Drake, the insurance guy. And the the families love it. And I'm getting referrals and I'm doing their daughters and their sister-in-laws. And it's it's just kind of selling smarter and deepening the relationship right out of the bat. Um, yeah, I, I can't imagine doing anything different ever again. We have unlimited inventory. I have the best support group in the world. And it's people from all over the country that have worked with you um, that want to help people. And they're not afraid to tell you secrets, tips, or tricks. Nobody's selfish. Everybody's supportive and wants to get better. Um, so the people that really work hard and continue 
have success. And that's kind of the big eye opener for me and the direction I'm going to continue to go in. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I appreciate you sharing so much, but it's, um, the last part you touched on is one of the things where I have found uh, that feeds my heart too in insurance is the willingness for people to share, right? Like, cause I've been in other sales gigs before, and maybe you've had this experience in previous, you know, uh, all the companies you've worked with is a lot of times you top producers, they keep everything close to the vest, right? They're like, they're, it's such a scarcity mindset of, you know, I can't tell you any, you may be able to, you may encroach on this little secret sliver of a demographic that I've figured out that I can make a little bit of money on. And then you come here and you can just literally listen to people. They'll go, you want to listen to my next 20 presentations? I'll tell you, share every single word I say, because I'm all, like, it's, I'm doing so well, like I'm doing so well beyond my own personal wildest dreams that I thought I could accomplish. It's almost the business in, intrinsically makes people like almost like if I don't share some stuff, like the big dudes upstairs are going to strike me down and not, it's going to keep me from making money. So it's almost people share so willingly now because they're so grateful as well. And I find that because my own personal experience with past business I've been in, I was in different sales cultures where, you know, there'd be a group that'd be like rising and you'd be like, Hey man, what are you doing? Oh, we just, you know, same thing. Like just nothing versus like, Hey, we do this, 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 this is how we say it. These are the objections. This is how we overcome the, this is the, and, and that's one of the things that I love that is so wonderful about FFL and at least our team culture, et cetera, is the live dial groups and just the uh, willingness. I mean, you can, there's not, there's, if you called a hundred top producers writing over 30, 40 a month, there may be eight that just they're kind of some selfish, selfish, you know, SOBs that just don't want to share, but 92 of them. So got an A average would probably take five, 10 minutes of your phone call. And you say, so I remember when I was starting to be like, how are you selling so much of X? And they go, well, I say this. And I'm like, I've never thought about saying that. And why would I ever think about it? Cause I never sold at their level. And that's really what's so great about this is, is almost anybody in our company is approachable and reachable because they're doing so well that it's like, we all want to give back and which kind of then this self kind of growing, self pruning and self growing tree uh, keeps getting fed and watered. So I love that you shared that, but that's just something for people to know. Um, we have a very, you know, giving culture here. So, okay. So let's talk about transition though. You, you, you got in, got started with us, got contracted, Jade in China. Um, you know, we got you started. We got you up and running. Um, what were the first kind of few weeks like, you know, what was it, you know, did you come out, did you sell everybody, you know, did you sell every lead you called? Like, you know, how was that sort of like self actualization period where you, you may have had some doubts set in and you go, I don't, this is harder than, than the brochure said, right? Like the, how did that, how did that first couple of weeks go? And then what helped you push through it? So the support helped me. Um, but there's no way I would have continued without your support and the support of so many people. I can't name them all. It would just take too long, but that open support, but I was banging my head against a wall because I've been in sales and customer service my whole life and the volume, you know, running power dialing, triple dialing 600 people before noon and not getting anyone on the phone and getting frustrated with the silence um, that I needed to start practicing in front of the mirror. I needed to just know that if I did get someone on the phone, I was going to give them my heart and everything, of every little bit of resource I had. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at all the shiny things that approach you, and it was a waste. Um, all I needed to do was put my phone down or put my head down and call. That's it. I didn't need to know the carriers more than, you know, three simple things. It's whole life. It's term life. You know, there's medications. There's not. Um, I wasted too much time going through multiple carriers, overthinking it. Uh, what I've done in the last three weeks, the, the big game changer, Grady, really was, you know, late at night. I went into all the live dials. Um and observed and was a fly on the wall. And like, like Jamie would say, you know, if you're not on camera, you're not working. Well, I was on camera. I was just kind of new and, you know, not really saying much and just observing. Well, I got addicted to living hope dials. Uh, the OGs and old girls in that group, 
um, just opened their arms to me. I remember approaching Sean for the very first time. Uh, I was like probably 9, 30, 10 o'clock his time. And he had just finished an appointment and he's just a wizard. He's methodical the way he talks to his clients. And I started asking him questions and thought he'd shut me down and not have any time. And instead, the guy spent like another hour telling me what he does and how he does it and why he likes to call during peak time. And he had reasons for everything he believes in. And it was so powerful that I decided the next day that that's where I'd hold myself accountable. And what I mean by that, this is my ninth week. And this last Sunday was the first day that I haven't been on 12, 14 hours every day. And that's because Bella had a bunch of 17 year old girls over here and uh, I needed to help mom. Um, that's the first day I missed. And you know what? I felt it like I, you know, you got to be with your family, but my daughters are older and that's my youngest. So right now it's about me serving other families and, and helping people with all the tragedies I've heard getting in and doing it and being held accountable to the group being that I'm not part of their group. I came, you know, I report directly to you. They all open up my arms to me. Every time I'm stuck, someone had the resource to answer or would go into a breakout room and provide knowledge that just blew my mind. Um, like I said, I'm on it. You know, I get up at three 30, I run on this bad boy uh, and I'm on there at 445, and there's a couple guys in Minneapolis that get on. Uh, Josh is on first every day, and he's last off every day, uh, Lockhart. Um, and you know, I pull him, I'm like, why are you, do you get paid extra to run these things? He's all, man, this is the office. Yeah. That's it. It's the office. You want to talk? Don't call me. Let's go in a breakout room. Let's just get it done. This is our office. And I was used to a virtual world. Uh, a little before the pandemic with the banking. So I was comfortable in Salesforce and Teams, but not video and not really being held accountable and teaching others and learning from others. And, you know, you have 8,516 people in your Slack. I just recently told the people using Discord, are you not on Slack? And they're like, no. And I'm like, dude, you think our little group posting, you know, every hour is kind of cool and sometimes not all day. Go over there because then you put a fire in your basement, right? Like Andrew Taylor says, because there's people going and going and going. And it's like so motivational. It's addicting. And, you know, I go in and I heart emoji everybody. I've been doing that for the nine weeks that I've been locked out in this group on Slack and in Discord because it's just like, hey, great job. I want to be like you and I want to be like the top producers. I want a brown and gold box on my shelf. How do I get there? Well, you just do it. You just have to commit. Um, the hours makes a difference because I'll break at like 11 California time when it's a little bit slower, unless you're calling retired folks and then go right back in at one. And it's literally like peak time somewhere at 5 AM. I'm on with Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina. And then, you know, 6 37, I'm rolling into Texas calling Louisiana. Um, there's no way not to structure your day to be more efficient and sell smarter and talk to people at the best possible time to reach them. So I learned that from you, obviously, and I learned it by not being afraid and finding a live dial room where people were there every every single day and for ridiculous amounts of hours. The top people spend, you know, 12 hours on there helping others. So uh, that that was really a game changer for me.